Hello all, Prof D here, getting into week five of Management 490 with uh, the Stoplight and Business Strategies. As always, we got our friendly little backpack dude here, tell us what's on the trail ahead. We're going to go over a bit of the things from the Gimawat and Rivkin uh, reading. I still want you to do it, um, but you can uh, check, you can look at some of these takeaways beforehand, and so you kind of know what to pay attention to. In the reading um, then we're going to get more into the stoplight and I've got a couple of examples to go through we're going to talk about the basic generic strategies cost leadership differentiation and the the middle ground of integration or the integrated strategy we we'll briefly do organizational documents how it relates to uh, business strategies and then there's a mini case but as always we go back in time and in this case we're going back to the previous lecture about um, internal analysis Things that can give you a sustainable competitive advantage. Here we use the VRIO framework, um, things that are valuable. Okay, uh, The resource capability increases the value of the service or helps lower its cost. Rare, rare means heter heterogeneously distributed across firms. Um, and rare in the sense that the resource capability is scarce relative to the demand for it. Then we have imi imitatability or substitutability. Um, basically, it's either really expensive to copy it or it's really difficult to copy it and specifically we talked about five aspects of uh, that prevents imitability of things gave examples for all those went through a couple examples of substitutability um, reverse engineering and strategic equivalence and finally we talked about organized to exploit the idea here is that organized to exploit is a final factor in the event that everything else is true okay it says that there's something about configuring those resources in combination with managerial and oper operational expertise that can actually help make those things a source of sustainable competitive advantage. You know, management and leadership matter. And then we have this handy dandy little chart. Basically, you're trying to get to four yeses in terms of whether or not the thing can give you a sustainable competitive advantage. And uh, you guys rolled with that in doing the strategy worksheets, which um, are looking pretty good. Uh, I'm looking forward to looking at those in more detail. But let's get into stuff today. We're talking about business level strategies. Now, before we talked about strategies about making choices and trade-offs, okay? This extends to business level strategies, choosing to perform certain activities differently or to perform different activities and rivals, and why, all right? And there are certain commitments and actions that a firm is taking to have a competitive advantage. And most importantly, we're addressing how you create value for your, your customers or consumers with the business. And we're moving on our sort of broad course overview. We've handled the blue part, okay, with external and internal analysis. So now we're moving on to the green part a little bit with uh, uh, here, value proposition and, and target market. This is where business strategies live all right we're gonna go we're gonna do this for a little bit and then we're gonna move over here <laughs> to to the red part but for now we're right here okay and you had this reading uh, Gimawat and Rifkin about a uh, competitive advantage the reading is a bit dense in part but it does a few nice things one is that it serves as a good transition from internal and industry analysis to the next area of our class about strategy formulation Okay. And it also provides some guidance about how to think about the transition from the industry analysis and the internal analysis to these business strategies. Um, it builds off the stuff that we've already learned. Okay. And trying to understand why there are differences in performance of the industries, we, you know, we talked about how Industry analysis gives you an idea of what the average level of profitability will be in an industry, right? based on the contours and the forces of that industry. Whereas internal analysis helps us to understand why there might be variation around uh, profitability in an industry based on things being real. All right, but take it a step further, this piece helps you to understand some of the ways to build a competitive advantage uh, specifically trying to do things, in fact, that sometimes will help blunt the nature of competition in an industry. Okay, And specifically, a firm creates a competitive advantage when it adds value. Okay, That's to say, when it can create something for which the willingness to pay is higher than the cost of making that thing. Now, 
Let's just go over a few of the, the points from this, okay? One of the points they made is that competitive advantage can help neutralize industry effects, okay? Um, having things that are Vrio and being able to create a gap between willingness to pay and cost are the ways that you can blunt some of the effects of, an, of, of the industry itself, okay? And competitive advantage, as I said before, is about added value, okay? And that specifically means the value that's created in the transaction as compared um, Compare, sorry, the value created by a firm in the transaction as compared to without it, right? So if a firm exists and it and it you know it provides some sort of service, if it goes away, whatever value disappears with that firm was not there, that was the value that they've added. Okay. And specifically to add value, and you you've known this since the early parts of the class, that the add value, you're trying to widen the wedge between willingness to pay and the cost to make something. Now there's a few other things that this reading gets into that we haven't touched upon yet. And one of those is that activities matter, right? The activities in the value chain can act in concert and act together to help widen the wedge. They can either help lower costs or raise willingness to pay. And we'll talk more about that specifically when we go into value chain in a future lecture, but just put that in your back pocket, right? Just that the way that activities are organized together matters. Another thing, you may have heard the term differentiated, okay? I need to make it very clear that differentiated does not mean different, okay? If you're a differentiated competitor, it means you've boosted the willingness to pay for your product or service or offering more than your competitors, okay? Another thing to think about is that you can, if you're trying to figure out you know, what to do, ways to create value, you can try to adjust your value proposition, right? Which is basically figuring out the mix in products or services uh, the attributes of those products or services that you're going to bring to the world. Uh, moving around that mix can change the value proposition you have for your potential customers. And on that point, another way that you can try to gain a competitive advantage is adjust the scope of who you serve, who and where, right? You might focus on a particular um, customer niche, a particular product niche. Okay, and then finally, for that that value creation to be sustainable, okay? It's gotta be unique compared to your rivals. Remember what I said um, previously about if everyone is super, no one is, right? So you're offering the way you put it together, it has to be unique compared to your rivals, which is why I made such a big deal about Vrio. Now we can put all of that together in this diagram, right? When you can put something out in the market that someone will pay more for than your costs, you have created or added value, right? The question always is how much of that value can you capture? The thing to remember is that if you have a, comp you have a competitive advantage, if you create more value relative to your competitors, that relative is important, right? And value is the distance between the cost of your product or service and the people's willingness to pay for it. How much of the value you can capture depends on where you set your price for your product. Now, what we're talking about, both the readings and this class, we don't talk about actually setting the price, right? The, the mechanics of how to do that are, are not available to us from this theory. But we can know one thing is that the price can never be set higher than the willingness to pay. And here's why. If the firm ever try to set the price above the willingness to pay of its customers, then the customers would have an incentive to basically do an end run around the producer and go try to go directly to the suppliers if possible, okay? As a firm, you have to share some of that value with your customer, right? So you have to create value and share value. It's very interesting because you think about business as being this kind of um, zero-sum game, but you're really trying to create and then share value with your consumer. Okay, now there's a couple of things that in this diagram I want to uh, connect to things in the reading. Okay, there they talk about something called supplier opportunity cost. Okay, and it's basically what you have to pay the suppliers for the goods to make your product. Now, where is the supplier opportunity cost? Okay, it's somewhere in here, in the red bar, okay? Part 
of the firm economic costs is whatever they have to pay to the supplier. Okay, and then somewhere in here also is the operating costs that the firm incurs to actually create their product or service. All right, Com taken together, the, the, what the what they have to pay to the supplier and what they have to pay to create their product together, those make up the firm economic cost. Okay. Now, the next point they made was a little weird, and I just want to, uh, it might have been a little hard to understand, but I kind of want to uh, talk about it in detail. Okay, And it's the notion that the added value of the company is really the amount they add to the transaction as compared if they as if they were absent from the transaction, right? So basically, if, if, you, if you create a product and it has there's a customer that's willing to pay for it, you create value. Whatever value you've added is whatever value would leave the transaction if the firm went away, okay? Now, that sounds weird, okay? But think of it like this. In the reading, there are these two companies that make cranes, Harnischweger and Cranco, okay? Harnischweger has a pretty dedicated market for its particular product, okay? But then Cranco comes along with exactly the same cost structure, okay? What happens if, what happens when that happens, okay? Well, oddly enough, no value is being added, okay? And the reason is, is because if any one firm went away, the other firm could take its place. And so there's no added value, right? In your heart of hearts, this kind of makes sense to you, even though the example's weird, right? If someone else out there is doing the exact same thing as you with the exact same cost structure, okay? And there's absolutely no difference in willingness to pay for the product. Well, it's hard to add value, right? And one of the ways that manifests itself is that there's really tight competition, which drives down profits, which is what happened to Harnischweger initially in the story, okay? So what did they do? Well, Harnischweger came and added additional services to their crane offering, like, you know, repair, warranty services, that kind of thing, okay? And with that happening, that actually drove up the willingness to pay for their offering. Right? And that's something that firms do. Right? They offer a product, someone else comes along and offers a similar product. Right? To boost their willingness to pay, they have to add additional stuff. Additional services, maybe additional aftermarket care, that kind of thing. All right. For example, cars are kind of a commodity product, right? You can get a car from any number of dealerships kind of for the same price, right? So one of the things that dealerships do is they actually have additional services that you can that you pay a little bit more for, right? And that can bring up your willingness to pay for that car from that particular dealership, right? What can you do as a firm to increase the willingness to pay of the customers you're trying to sell something to? That's what we're interested in. Okay. Now, with all of those things said, you know, what are the drivers that allow you to create value? There's really two, okay? You can either drive up the willingness to pay or you can drive down the cost to produce. And that's in another one of the readings, the one from Porter. Okay. It's a little long, so if you don't read it all, don't sweat it too much. But the point here is that Porter suggests that you can only kind of really do one or the other increase willingness to pay or lower costs. It's very hard to do both. And thinking about how to either increase willingness to pay or lowering cost to produce and how those can mitigate Porter's five forces, you end up with the next chart. I'm calling these business level strategies that's pretty common. Porter called them generic strategies. And the reason is, is because if you thought about generic ways you could mitigate the five competitive forces to his mind, you would end up with this table. Okay, so got the got the five forces up in the corner. Okay, so 
if you're in this side of stuff, the low cost, the cost leadership area, okay, it allows you to it allows you to compete more if rivals come in. If new rivals try to enter the market, you have a better cost position, so you can compete on price and do better than them. If powerful buyers come in, if your cost structure is low, um, you'll be fine because if they're if powerful buyers come in, they will try to drive down the price. But if you have a low cost structure, you can you can fend off that. Powerful suppliers may come in and they try to raise the prices on you. But if you're already operating at a low cost, you can mitigate that. Because if you're operating at low costs, you're probably also already taking advantage of economies of scale or learning effects, and those things make entry into the market harder. Right? And low being the low cost provider generally favors you against the threat of substitutes. Right? Differentiation, the other side here, they protect because they protect from rival because of things like brand loyalty. Right? Some of you listening to this are Coke drinkers. Coke is a differentiated competitor. Even though the cost of their product and the price of their product is low, they are a differentiated competitor because they could sell it for a lot less than they do and still make a profit, right? But people are loyal to Coke. Some people refuse to drink Pepsi, right? Brand loyalty can be a barrier to entry. It can, it can blunt the effects of rivalry. If you're a differentiated product, you also have space to deal with supplier cost increases because you already have a pretty high willingness to pay for your product amongst the people that you sell it to. So if a supplier tried to raise costs on you, you could bear those. Right? And if you are a truly differentiated product with a high willingness to pay, there's a good chance your buyers can't switch that easily. All right. Now, I've rattled on a bit, and you may be wondering if there's a difference between um, business models and business strategy. Okay, there is, and I will get to that. Okay, but the one other thing I want to note on this is the fact that in addition to there being this low cost and differentiation side, there's also this approach to market, the broad, focused, narrow niche side. Okay, there's different markets that you could be approaching, right? And low cost strategies might look a little different in a focused or a niche market as compared to a broad one. Okay. Now, one big thing to note, and you might have seen some of these things from the readings, that uh, something might be expected of companies that are trying to execute these kinds of strategies. For example, if you're cost leadership, you have to focus on costs. And that means really tight control. Tight control over costs. It means tight reporting structures. You reward people for hitting clear targets and lowering costs, and you supervise the crap out of people because costs matter so much, so you're really on them. All right, whereas for differentiation, other things matter more. Here you might need more coordination and cooperation between areas of the company to make sure that the best and most high quality ideas float to the top. You want creative, creativity, innovation, as that can help you to keep differentiating your project. Okay, And by extension, this may lead to more qualitative measures of employee performance. Um, you want to reward innovation in a space like this, but that's hard to do. Okay, because how do you precisely measure innovation? It's difficult, right? But you still want to reward it, right? So you're operating in a different space. So depending on where you are in one of these strategies, the way your organization looks is going to be different. Now, back to what I was saying about business model and business strategy. Sometimes people will use them interchangeably, but to be technical and pedantic about it, they're not the same, right? Think about a business model as some activities, drivers, things that achieve a particular business strategy. There are several types of business strategies, like the ones in that diagram we just saw, but there's many types of business models. And if you wanna see some, here, here's a bunch of them. This slide is more for your reference than anything, but you could apply cost leadership or differentiation strategies to these models with varying degrees of success, right? You've seen some of these. Um, many of you will be uh, familiar with the razor blades mar model, right? Where um, it originally comes from the razor and blades, right? The handle is 
the the handle is cheap uh, and then but the, the but you know you go and buy the blades they're expensive the modern name version of this is the printers and ink okay right the ink is crazy expensive crazy crazy expensive to purchase okay um, another example that's pretty common that you might see now in terms of business models the freemium model right where and you, you see this in apps a lot right the app itself is free but there's additional benefits and services if you pay for it you get some benefit from just having the free app but if you want the the really cool version of the free app you have to pay it's a freemium model right again more for your reference than anything it's interesting check it out now as weird as these concepts may seem you inherently know some things about cost leadership and differentiation. You've seen them in action. You've seen them at work in commercials that you've watched, right? So let's play that out, okay? I'm gonna put on a couple of commercials and you tell me and think about what you see. And then I'll, I'll talk about it briefly after each one. It's rollback time at Walmart and everyone's pitching in, even me. Just by driving smarter routes and making sure our trailers are packed fuller, we save millions of dollars on fuel costs. And when costs go down, prices go down. We're talking about thousands of rollbacks on the things you need every day. It's a beautiful thing. My name is Mike, and I save people money so they can live better. It's rollback time at Walmart. Okay, so... Many of you know that company, that's Walmart. Okay, some interesting things to note about that commercial, right? Um, they tell you very clearly what they're about. They're about selling you stuff for cheap and they tell you how they do it. They tell you that they figured out all kinds of ways to save costs, to be more efficient, right? And that basically they can take all that and pass those savings on to you right we don't we don't see a ton of, of distinguishing features about mike right he's in a walmart uniform right mike could be any truck driver right nothing distinguishing about it it's all about keeping their costs low so they can in turn have lower prices right walmart's very clear about that you've seen other stores do things like that right they don't focus so much on anything particular about how cool the store is or how interesting it is but really just about how they are going to deliver you the lowest prices possible right? now this stands in contrast to this next commercial where does your take off So right away, very different. We don't find anything out about the specifics of the product until the very end and they flash it quickly. What we really see is a really cute kid and a really attractive father living in a pretty nice house with a fancy car that goes to space. Right? They're trying to do something very different there. They are trying to appeal to a very specific segment of the population both in terms of socioeconomic income and family status right and they are trying to appeal to people's sense about the future 
right? All of those things are meant to evoke a certain association with the brand here, Tesla, in hopes to drive up willingness to pay. The kinds of commercials that you see give you can give you an idea of what kind of business strategy the firm has. All right. But let's look at these in a little bit of detail because it's going to help flesh out the argument. So let's start with Walmart. Okay. Now, think about this for a second. Okay. Is willingness to pay for Walmart's customers going to be high or low? Okay. Well, it's going to be low. Right. A lot of the stuff that Walmart sells, you can get anywhere. Many of the things they sell are commodity goods, right? And your willingness to pay, people's willingness to pay for commodities goods is, is kind of fixed, okay? I know that a gallon of milk costs about three bucks. I know that I can get one roll of paper towels for about a dollar, right? So I'm not willing to pay more for those commodity goods, all right? In case the willingness to pay is going to be equal to the price where I can get this stuff anywhere, right? So the customer gets no value if their willingness to pay is low, right? So there's not necessarily a reason for them to choose you over any other competitor, right? So what's Walmart's deal? Walmart tries to bring down the cost of the good. Okay, they bring down the cost of the good. They do that uh, a function of being really well organized. They've invested a lot of fixed costs in their logistics operations so they can efficiently get things from place to place. Um, they've gotten so big that they really exploit their size in terms of effectively bullying suppliers into lowering their price. Okay. They have built their competitive advantage up around lowering costs. Okay. Now, the thing about this kind of strategy, okay, is that you lower the costs, but you have to have an acceptable level of quality. Okay. The thing can't be absolute garbage that you're selling. All right. So you have to keep the you have to keep the quality at a bare minimum so people are still willing to pay for it, but try to bring down the costs. Okay. And so if Walmart brings down the cost of what they're of of the thing of their offerings, then what they can also do is bring down the price. Okay? What you want to think about here is that honestly, for most of the commodity goods we pay for, the willingness to pay for it isn't that high. It's probably something like right here. Okay, very close to the price. Right. So, in order to compete in this kind of space, you really have to try to bring down the costs. And that's what Walmart does. Its competitive advantage relative to other competitors is centered around bringing down costs, right? Because by bringing down the costs, they can help effectively create greater value and share some of it with their customers. They still need to make money, right? So they don't bring down the prices too much, but that's Walmart's overall strategy. Now, again, how do they do it? All right, there's a few low cost levers that they can pull, all right? The cost of the input factors, like I mentioned, Walmart has very effective logistics operations, but they also just bully their suppliers, so their, their inputs are cheaper. Okay, um, they also probably don't pay people as much as they should, right? That's also that's also an input, right? Okay. Um, then they also benefit from economies of scale and learning effects. Now, I have said this more than one time. So I actually wanted to show you a picture of what economies of scale actually means. Okay. There are certain things for which it's more efficient to produce more of them. 
okay? And the relation of the cost per unit to the quantity to produce kind of looks like this, okay? Rarely is there something for which the economies of scale, this just keeps on going down. It doesn't really happen. Usually there's some point where the cost curve goes back up, okay? And here's the first part. This is economies of scale, all right? This is where you start to realize lower costs per unit the more of something that you sell, right? In the case of Walmart, they had some pretty massive fixed costs investing in building out one of the most state-of-the-art logistics infrastructures in the world, okay? But they have such a large store footprint now that they can spread out those fixed costs over a larger space. Oh, I mean a larger space, over more units. They can spread out those fixed costs over more units, right? Other firms would have trouble doing this. Okay. But this doesn't go on forever, right? You can't, you can't bring this down forever. You get to a point where this kind of goes flat, which you have constant returns to scale, where you've kind of hit the, the sort of the minimum efficient scale for your business, okay? Um, or is it maximum efficient scale? You've hit the point where you're no longer getting any decreases in cost per unit, is what I'll say. And then you experience constant returns to scale. Now, there is a point where this will start curving back up, right? Now, why would you get diseconomies of scale? It's when you get so big that it's possible that you have coordination problems, right? It gets hard to manage the workforce to make the product. Maybe there is some sort of resource constraint on, on the inputs um, for making your product or service. That's when you would get diseconomies of scale, okay? The other thing is, yeah, so why do you get economies of scale? I talked about both of those. You spread out fixed costs over larger output or you create specialized systems in order to manage that, okay? Then the other thing you have are learning effects. I was first noticed uh, during, I think, the, during production during World War II, is just by virtue of making more things, the cost per unit of making that thing tended to go down over time. You pick up efficiencies, you get to understand how to make it better, all of those things happen, okay? This, is the learning effect is basically when you get on a lower cost curve over time okay the lower curve over time i mean you will experience learning effects but the hope is that as you learn you move to a lower curve now why do you get learning effects okay again you get more efficient over time right you get more familiar with how to do things um, you eventually learn to standardize certain things, standardize parts or inputs, standardize processes, okay? Um, a great example of learning effect actually is Netflix, okay? Um, Netflix learned how to make its, uh, when it, back when it was mailing out DVDs, it figured out a way to make its envelopes the precisely right size in order to make the processing at the um, postal post office much more efficient, okay? So basically standardizing the envelopes and learning how to make it more uh, efficient. And then technological improvements. Basically, as the technology improves, you can, you can have a lower cost per unit, right? And that's Walmart for you, right? So here's the question is where does Walmart fall on this grid? So take a minute and think about where it's gonna be. I think you can figure this out, All right? Walmart is a low cost, broad competitor. Right. Right. They their their approach to market is for everyone. Right, and they are centered around bringing down costs. Uh, that makes sense. Right. For example, you know, one thing you can always sort of get give you an idea of like the as far as retail goes, what space they're competing in. Right. How easy is it to find someone to help you in the store? Right. Like, if you really want to know where something is, how easy is it to find someone to help you? Walmart, I mean, goodness, help you if, if you need somebody. You, you, better, you better figure out your way around the store and find it yourself. Because by the time you find someone to help you get there, you might have just looked for it yourself. All right. Now, this is compared to Tesla. All right. 
let's talk this through. Okay. If Tesla is going to have a competitive advantage relative to other car makers, it has to try to create more value. Now, making a Tesla is probably expensive. All right. So while it's important to keep costs low, they are not going to be lower than any luxury car maker who has been in business for 30 years. Probably not. Okay. So if, it, if it's going to create value, what is it going to have to do? Right? The answer is that it's going to have to increase willingness to pay while doing its best to keep costs under control. And again, the point here is that the competitive advantage results in creating greater value than your competitors. Okay, well, how does Tesla do this? Well, they're going to have some differentiation drivers, right? Just like we had low cost drivers, we've got differentiation drivers. Um, two important ones for Tesla, product features and customer service. You know, Tesla has all those fancy bells and whistles, right? It's got the, the automatic driving. It does it have self parking? I don't know. I don't have a Tesla. I don't, I don't make Tesla money, um, but it's got all these features. But another thing is that they have cu amazing customer service. Right. I don't know if they do this as much now, but I know that in the earlier days of Tesla, if you had a problem, they'd send somebody out to your house to talk with you. Right. Remember what I said earlier in the lecture about, you know, additional services. Right. So. The product is part of it, but the additional services layered on top of it, those are the kind of things that can also increase willingness to pay. Now. Where do we think Tesla falls on this graph, on this chart? Think about it for a second. Now, I think part of it's easy, right? The question is, is what is their approach to the market, right? Because if you think about what Tesla is, they are definitely a differentiated competitor, right? The question is, is whether they're broad or focused. Now, I'd make the case that Tesla has been actually moving between quadrants. And here's why. When Tesla first got started, it was, you know, sort of looking at that commercial, it's really trying to sell a highly focused product to a very specific set of people. People with money who love the idea of having an electric car. Right? People with a high willingness to pay for an eco-friendly, flashy sports car, which is what the initial Teslas were, with the money to do it, right? They're paying for like the status of owning a Tesla. Now, doing that allowed Tesla to have the basis for building out all of its infrastructure and establishing economies of scale. Now, once it had some basically some people buying the car and its name out there and it's gotten established and it started actually building out its infrastructure then it started making sedans which are a more broad appeal car right sedans are specifically for you know family people right they're a family car so tesla's moving in this direction now, i don't know if they'll ever get fully here but they're definitely no longer a differentiated focus competitor. Okay, now, I'm gonna go into a couple of the elements of, of cost leadership strategy and differentiation strategy uh, so you, you understand the differences and what to look for. Okay, so in a cost leadership strategy, they are goods or services that are at the lowest cost, but still acceptable to customers, okay? And this is a great space when customers do not perceive substantial differences between products, all right? And your goals are to have a lower cost than your rivals and perform activities cheaply or get rid of activities if you can, right? Again, control, 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 get costs low, all right? And I put these pictures up because they're, they're absolutely brilliant right? Uh, Dr. Bob and corn shapes. Um, it wasn't Dr. Bob when I was a kid, but my dad would definitely buy this, uh, 
this off-brand Dr. Pepper kind of soda. That's what this is, Dr. Bob, right? And corn shapes, corn shapes is hilarious, right? Right, because you know what they're trying to sort of, the things that they're trying to uh, evoke with this, right? This is looks like a liger, maybe a cross between a tiger and a lion, right? And it's got a blue box like Frosted Flakes, but it's not that obviously, okay? There are people, there's some customers for whom the difference between Dr. Bob and Dr. Pepper is zero, right? And so they'll buy Dr. Bob. That's why you have these sort of weird cheap products in stores because some customers do not perceive any difference between them. No difference, and so they buy them. Now the question is how you actually get cost leadership. What are the things you have to do, okay? Some of them I mentioned before, you know, learning effects, economies of scale, Okay, uh, process innovation, outsourcing, right? If there's some part of your business that you don't need to do inside, either because um, you're not great at it or someone else can do it cheaply, you outsource it, right? You try to automate as many processes as possible, okay? One of the things that, you know, speaking of automation, or this is adjacent to automation, self-checkouts, right? That's the whole point of that is to is to lower costs. And then you have tight process control. You want full control over everything that's happening, right? Sometimes cost leadership companies cannot might not be as as uh, as fun to work for because they're very they're gonna be very top down. They're organized to be productive and efficient because when you're Doing cost leadership, you are trying to bring your costs as low as possible. And just to bring up, get, get the precise definition, because minimum efficient scale is where you're at the production, where the long run average cost is minimized. So just to, because I want to be, I want to be complete about this, just to go back to this diagram, this point right here, give or take, this is supposed to be flat. So this point where you've minimized the long run average costs per unit, this is minimum efficient scale. Okay. All right. So cost leadership sounds you know, interesting, but there's some challenges. Okay. First is that there's imitation. Okay. People can come along and try to imitate your what, what it is you're doing, imitate your products. Okay. And the problem with imitation is that when there's imitators, there's less value being created by any one person in that space, right? So that can have downward pressure on prices, okay? Um, equal cost, but more features, okay? So you could have a product out there um, and then someone else can come along and have a, a technologically superior process and they can create um, a product similar to yours, at the same cost, but they can add more features to theirs. Right? So that I can put downward pressure on you. You don't know where that's going to come from. Right? And all of these things can result in a race to the bottom. Right? Price competition is ugly. You never want to get into it. Right? Because there's just it, just it just doesn't stop. That's what a race to the bottom is in terms of prices and quality. It's not what you want. So those are the dangers of cost leadership. Right? On the other hand, we've got differentiation. Right? That's when you're trying to develop unique products. Right? These are where you're trying to drive up the, the customer's willingness to pay because your products have differences that consumers value. Right? And it may be that the product has unique features. It may be that the product is perception-based. Right? It is perceived to have um, unique aspects. Um, I know I talk about Coke and Pepsi a lot, right? but Coke and Pepsi is mostly water and then it's mostly sugar 
with a little bit of flavor. In the 80s and times, especially in blind taste tests, people didn't know which one was which. Right? So part of the differentiation is perception. Another example. Vodka. Vodka is a flavorless grain alcohol of a certain alcohol content. Right? There's very strict laws about what vodka can be. The differences between vodkas are effectively zero. But there's a lot in terms of perception. Right? That's why a bottle of Grey Goose vodka, which is perceived to be of greater quality because it's French and it comes in a fancy clouded bottle, is perceived to be better than, say, Smirnoff vodka, even though there's very little difference between vodkas. That is another example of perception-based differentiation. Okay. So how does one do that? Um, you spend a lot of money in research and development and innovation, right, such that you're creating you know, better products. Uh, you have a deep knowledge of what consumers want and need, and you try to cater to that because you want to make it clear that the features of what you're offering is um, are something that they value. Branding. You care a lot about your brand because your brand is a symbol of things being or having features, but also have people having a different perception of it. Okay, uh, premium prices. The price needs to reflect the fact that what you're offering is better. In some cases, raising the price on something can actually make people think it is worth more, and they buy and they'll buy it even though you've changed nothing about it. Um, Chivas Regal did this. I know a few things about booze. Um, it's worth looking up. Chivas Regal um, wanted to change its marketing and uh, appeal to a different uh, clientele with its blended whiskey. Right. So what did they do? They put it in a fancy bag and they just simply raised the price. The underlying product did not change at all. They just raised the price. Some schools and universities have done that too. They've just raised the price to stand out more. Um, you also have targeted marketing, and you almost always have a well-developed customer care function. Because again, that service, that customer care service on top of the product increases the willingness to pay. And that's what you're about with differentiation. You're trying to increase the willingness to pay. And everything at the organization is organized around maintaining and emphasizing the, the firm's image and making a very high-quality service offering product for which people will value and pay more for. Now, just to make one thing clear, differentiation is not the same thing as segmentation. Segmentation is actually on the other axis, and I'm going to talk about it more in a second, a little more than a second, okay? Segmentation and differentiation are not the same thing. Now, the dangers of differentiation, okay, it's possible that customers will stop valuing your features. Okay, sometimes features simply go out of vogue, or go out of interest, and so you can no longer be a differentiated competitor with that particular offering. Right? And sometimes differentiation is temporary. Right? Other imitation can happen, and other people can re uh, reproduce your, your features, things that were a differentiating factor before are no longer that. A uh, big one is that trends can change. Now, trends changing really hurt Forever 21. Okay, Forever 21 went bankrupt a couple of years ago. And one of their problems is that they expanded too quickly and their supply chain couldn't keep up with changing clothes as quickly as consumers wanted. Right? Trends change faster than, than they could deal up they could deal with, right? Um, so their 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 differentiation strategy didn't work, and so they're they're gone now. As compared to Zara, which is has Zara's an interesting company. They have quite a sophisticated uh, supply chain that responds pretty well to trends changing. Um, 
And then there's the idea of having either an overextended product line or overextended expansion. Um, a good example of an overextended product line. So basically, you're trying to differentiate. And so one of the ways you end up differentiating is that you have lots and lots of different unique options. Okay. The idea is that all of them have different feature set that will appeal to somebody. Right? But it can be very difficult to maintain all those different product lines. An example of a company that had issues with an overextended product line was Apple in the late 90s, right before Steve Jobs came back. They simply had too many products. It was hard to maintain any identity for them. And some of the features of these products were not actually valued by, by the consumers. Right? So one of the first things that Steve Jobs did when he was hired back to Apple in the late 90s was that he slashed the products that Apple made from like 17 to four, All right? Such that the differentiation strategy that really is the basis for what Apple does was, uh, was easier to execute. They had fallen into a trap that comes with differentiation and Steve Jobs helped them get out of it. All right. Now, the other part of this equation is the target market, right? And basically you can think of it as being on the on a continuum from broad, where the firm competes in many different customer seg segments, or focused or niche. The firm has a one segment or a certain group of segments, and, th and they focus and tailor their strategy around serving that niche. Okay? Now, the different kinds of focus strategies are basically they're trying to, you're trying to produce goods or services that serve a particular segment's needs, okay? And you can be either focused cost leadership or focused differentiation, right? You still have the other elements of both cost leadership and differentiation. You're just focusing on a narrow set of people. Now, you can attempt to segment markets on, on the basis of basically anything, right? Here's an example of some ways to segment markets, okay? And this goes back to what um, Gimwatt and Rifkin are talking about in scope, right? One of the things you can do to try to have a competitive advantage is you can try to limit the scope of your offering. You can either limit on things like culture, I mean, um, geographical areas. You can try to structure it around certain, um, certain like income groups. You could try to segment around certain demographic factors. If you're talking about consumers, you can do the same thing for industrial markets, right? Because not all things being sold are being sold to people, they can be sold to other companies, and you can do the same things, focus on geographic segments, um, focus on certain parts of the value chain, um, customers of a certain size, you could smell to really small businesses or really large businesses, right? So to put this in sort of context, you, you might imagine that a, uh, it's fairly easy to my mind to come up with companies that are broad, differentiated or broad cost leadership, right? Um, broad differentiated would be Starbucks. All right, they serve lots of different segments. Broad uh, cost leadership would be um, Walmart. All right, but sometimes coming up with a focused cost leadership or focused differentiation is a little bit harder. Okay, some examples of a focused cost leadership company would be Jiffy Lube. Those of you who don't know Jiffy Lube, they are a very affordable place that you can get your oil changed. All right. They do one thing, right? Focus on um, basically a, a segment that, right? That wants their that wants their oil chains for a low cost, and um, the cost is what matters to them, right? And it does, and and they're not focusing on all customers, right? Because people with someone with a Ferrari is not bringing their car to Jiffy Lube to get to get the oil changed. They're never going to do that, right? Right, so there's just there's a subsegment of the population that's going to bring their car to Jiffy Lube to get the oil changed. Now, I'm sure Jiffy Lube does a good job, but um, when I get when I get my my car service to change, I take it to a I take it to a, a dealer uh, workshop to do that. Okay, uh, an example of a focused on the notion of Ferrari, an example of a focused differentiated player would be Ferrari. Right, there's a very limited number of Ferraris made, and it's for a very specific set of people, right? The people that want one and know where to get one. Are there Ferrari commercials? No, none at all, right? Because they're so niche that they can address that niche in very different ways. Now, how would you go about finding a niche to operate in, okay? 
Um, one way is strategic group analysis. We talked about this in, um, in an earlier lecture. The idea being is that you can put uh, two of these areas on a grid and try to basically see where there's white space. Right? You could have a business and you could think about geographic coverage and price level, right? And where you don't see somebody operating, then that's a place that you can operate. You're trying to find an area where there's basic where there's no no occupants. And that can be a way to actually carve out a competitive advantage in the industry. Um, but as with the other strategies, always a danger of the focus strategy. Okay. One is that your market niche could disappear. Right? They just may all of a sudden be, you know, when you're when you're already dealing with a narrow po a narrow population or a narrow customer segment, their tastes could change and your niche could be gone. Right? Um, you could get broad market competitors. Right? A big competitor might all of a sudden say, you know, why don't we drop in and start serving this niche? What if Walmart says, you know what, let's just open up a bunch of oil chain stations in Walmart parking lots and dip into Jiffy Lube's niche? Okay. You never know when a broad market competitor is going to dip into your niche. They might have the resources to do so. Uh, and then another challenge is barrier to growth, right? By definition, niches are limited. Okay. And there may simply be a point where you can't grow anymore in that particular niche. Yeah. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, well, if you can, you know, there's benefits and there's challenges to being cost leadership, and there's benefits and challenges to being differentiated, and there's benefits and challenges to being focused. It's like, why can't you do all the things? All right, well, you can. You can try at least. And there is a company that kind of tries to occupy that space in the middle goes by the name of Target. Think about Target for a minute, right? First of all, people call it things like Target. And it's a bit of a joke, but it's to note that it's slightly fancier than a place like Walmart. If you want some help at Target, you can usually find it, right? And they have sometimes fancy, like, partnerships with people. Like sort of like fancy brand names while also selling, you know, fairly low price goods at the same time. Target tries to operate in the center. The idea is you want some differentiation, but you still want to keep prices reasonable. You're not the cheapest, but you're not the most expensive either. All right. But there's still challenges with that. All right. Your costs are going to be too high so you can never ever beat the low cost competitor right which is fine as long as the customers see value to justify your higher prices but maybe it's possible that customers don't see enough value to justify your higher prices right target can have a slightly higher price good than walmart but people may come into target and be like okay i see it but this target these target jeans are not so much better than the walmart jeans right um, there's a potential for feature creep is that once you start to basically differentiate yourself it's very easy to keep trying to do it right that's what feature creep is you keep adding more and more features if any of you have ever done anything in um like any sort of a a project like a website or an app uh, one of the challenges is that you keep thinking of new things that you can add to it. Engineers are like, oh, we could add this feature and this feature and this feature, and you get a feature creep. It just keeps on going, snowballing. That's what can happen when you try to differentiate yourself. That's how you end up with an overextended product line. Feature creep. Okay. Um, but the last one is that it's hard to be efficient and innovative. All right. They have different setups. Because remember what I said before about the sort of cost leadership strategy is that you're trying to be efficient, which means you need to have really tight control over things. You have to deeply monitor people in order to keep costs down. And that's very much at odds with being innovative. When you want to be innovative, you want people to have free reign to come up with ideas. Right? 
And that's what a differentiated competitor wants. It wants innovation. It wants people to come up with new beverages. It wants people to come up with new devices. Right? It's hard to do innovation efficiently because innovation needs space to run. And efficiency very much wants to control things. Right? So you can try to do an integrated strategy, but it's a hard place to operate. Now, overall, business strategy is, if you're successfully executing it, this goes back to things I talked about earlier, you're lessening the impact of the five forces. Okay. Now, I've included a couple of slides here for you to, to review on your own time, and they'll obviously be in the, um, the, do the document itself, the slide deck, so you can look at it. All right. But there are certain things that the where the, the five forces and the strategy overlap, overlap right? So, for example, um, a cost leadership strategy, well, that can frighten off new entrants, right? Because you need to enter massively to be cost competitive and it takes time to learn, okay? If you wanted to come in and challenge Walmart, it would be hard. You'd have to be absolutely massive to do it and walmart has already had 30 years to figure out how to move down the learning curve and to do things more efficiently right so a cost leadership set, set strategy can frighten off new entrants right and then it can also mitigate certain of the forces so for example you can absorb cost increases because you're the low cost position already right so you should review these on your own i won't read all these out loud because that would be boring but check them out these are make this will make a good worksheet question I'm not saying i'm definitely going to do it but it would make a good worksheet question all right then there's also differentiation strategy in five forces okay um a differentiation strategy can mitigate supplier power right because you have a more much higher willingness to pay your customers have a much higher willingness to pay for the product right and so if your suppliers raise the prices on you, you can still deal with that because you already have a higher margin product. Okay. But the other tricky thing that you can do is that you can pass along those cost increases to your customers because they are committed to your brand. They have brand loyalty. They're not going to switch. All right, again, look over these and see if they make sense. And if they don't, just ask some questions um, in the chat or over email. All right. We will talk more about organizational documents throughout the course. But if you're trying to understand the generic business strategy of a company, a great place is looking at the 10K. And one that I think is you know interesting is a pretty clear example is... Da -da -da. Coke. All right, again, a 10K is the required annual reporting that every publicly traded company in the United States has to give to the SEC. Okay? And there are certain things that are in it. And you can look at this and actually get an idea of what basically what the company's strategy is. Sometimes they say it explicitly, other times you have to look for clues to understand it, okay? Competition, okay? They tell you who their competitor are, they say that their biggest competitor is Pepsi, right? Um, they say what their competitive factors are. Competitive factors impacting their business include but are not limited to pricing, advertising, sale promotion, point of sale marketing, product and ingredient innovation, okay, new packaging, uh, competitive strengths, okay, this is important. Competitive strengths include leading brands with a high level of consumer acceptance, a worldwide network of bottlers and distributors of company products, sophisticated marketing capabilities, and a talented group of dedicated associates, okay? These are the kind of things that help you know that Coke is a differentiated competitor. 
sophisticated marketing capabilities. You only invest in really good marketing if you are trying to be a differentiated player, okay? High levels of consumer acceptance, right? Lots of people like this product, high willingness to pay for it, okay? Talented group of dedicated associates. That, that means they actually probably pay their people pretty well, right? These are the kinds of things that a differentiated competitor does. So these are places where you can go and try to understand how, what kind of strategies firms have, the 10Ks. Now, we're going to go through our little mini case, right? And it's the uh, generic business strategy sorting game. So what do we have? We've got some companies. Okay? And the idea is that you basically take the companies and put them where you think they go in one of these boxes. Okay? I'll give you some examples. Okay? Do a couple with you. So I already mentioned a couple of them. Okay. Ferrari. Ferrari is here. Okay? Very narrow market, highly differentiated product. High performance sports car. Not a lot of they don't make a ton of them. Not a lot of people are buying them, right? There's a very narrow population that can afford that can buy a Ferrari. Okay? They're they're focusing on a very narrow customer base. Walmart. Broad target cost leadership for all the reasons we've already articulated. Apple. Apple's probably somewhere around here. Okay. Their their products are fairly expensive, so there there is so and they have a fairly high so first of all, it's high willingness to pay for their products. So that's why they're definitely differentiation. Okay. Um, and then Apple's products, many of them have a have a broad appeal. Um, their computers do not. Okay. Um, Apple has maybe 7% of the personal computer market. They dominate in the over $1,000 category for, for computers and laptops, but there's not a lot of people buying those, right? So that's why Apple is closer to the line here. And the idea is to go through and do all of these. Okay, whoops. Ah! <laughs> is to go through and do all these and see what you come up with. So just hit pause and check them out. All right, come on back. Let's see what you did. Okay. Here's what I did. Yours may look slightly different, but this is about where I would put stuff. I'm happy to explain why on some of these, if you have any questions later. Um, but a couple of them are a little tricky. Uh, Netflix at one point was actually probably more of a, uh, of a cost leadership company, right? Um, it was in the business of basically just renting movies and trying to do it as efficiently as possible. Um, then they moved into creating their own content that you can only get on Netflix, trying to increase people's willingness to pay for their product. That put Netflix more over here. Pepsi and Coke are up here. Starbucks, Apple's down here, okay? Um, Motel 6, um, some of you may know Motel 6. Motel 6s are very, very, very value oriented. And they tend to be next to highways. The idea being is that you're simply too tired to keep going for the night and you just need some place to sleep for one night. That's a Motel 6, right? Southwest is also in this quadrant. Why is Southwest here? Well, Southwest tends, is, is definitely a, is a low cost operator. It always has been. The reason it's narrow is that Southwest doesn't go everywhere. Right? That was, that's part of the reason the Southwest was a little, was, was, has been cheaper historically, is that they don't go to some of the major airports. Right? They, usually, they often go to the second airport in a city, like, like not going into SFO, but going into Oakland Airport in California. Okay? If you have trouble with these, just look them up, you know, and see what, see what it is that they do. Right? 
look at their 10K, see how they're described. Okay, Dyson is the vacuum people. They, they you know, the $500 vacuums. Again, um, a lot of their products are very, are, first of all, they're very high priced and high margin. Um, but you can get comp you can get comparable part products for less. Um, it's just that uh, they try to differentiate themselves on the overall quality of their products, how well the vacuums suck. And I don't mean the derogatory sense of the word suck, but actually how well they, they suck up stuff. Right? So, if you have any questions about this, let me know. But this is, uh, this is kind of what I got. I'm happy to talk about these in more detail. Drop a question in the chat. You know what would be really good is, you know, discuss this in the chat. Probably should have told you that already. But discuss it in the chat. All right. And with that, brings this lecture to a close. Uh, I love what you guys have been doing. You've been working really hard, and that makes me so happy. You're asking great questions in, in the chat and over email. I'm having great meetings with all of you. Um, so keep working hard. I love it. And, uh, and I will keep working hard. I know I've got to get caught up on some grading and things. I always have to you know, get a little caught up on stuff. But uh, I really appreciate your patience and I appreciate your hard work. And I look forward to talking to you all soon.